worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about Blessed be the name of Jesus. Well, no, just another regular Wednesday night here at uh, Bellevue. Now, we just sang something and y'all didn't do it. You didn't lift your hands, a lot of you. So we're going to give you another shot. I've been asked, will we do this in heaven? And I've said, yes, we're going to. Now, some people say it draws attention to me. It does not. You're pointing to Jesus, all right? 
How many of you know that it's in the Bible? Anybody know it's in the Bible? All right, look, I can, look, keep that hand up. I like it. All right, that's right. Keep your hand Now get your other one up. When, when, when you're under arrest, what do you do? When your grandkids run to you, grandparents, what do they do? Let's run to Jesus, all right? Let's run to Jesus. And when it says, we lift up holy hands in one accord, that doesn't mean you're riding around in a Honda, all right? It means you're going to get your hands up, and we're going to worship the Lord, all right? So when that comes around, Brother Mark, do it again. you find a couple of people there by you let's make this a house of prayer and uh, just get in groups of threes and fours right there and one of you start praying don't don't introduce just one of you start praying tell Jesus all of my troubles. I cannot bear these burdens alone. If I will cry, he readily hears me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. 
Father, we thank you that you're a very present help in time of need. We thank you that you're as close as the mention of the name of Jesus. Let's all say his name together, Jesus. And we give you praise and glory. Receive our worship tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn around and greet the folks around you and welcome them to the Lord. to testify. Come on. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can't feel it, somebody testify, testify.
in this time of desperation when all we know is doubt and fear there is only one foundation we believe we believe broken generation when all is dark you help us see there is only one salvation we believe we believe many of you believe that? Amen. 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 We're going to have our offering, and we want to encourage you. Yeah, y'all can go ahead and be seated. That'd be fine. That's fine. Uh, we want to encourage you to give tonight, and uh, we are so blessed to have uh, Jonathan Evans here tonight. I'll introduce him momentarily, but uh, he has Four children and one on the way. How about that? Yeah, man. All right. Yeah. And uh, so he needs a good offering. All right. So we need to <laughs> give this man. He is one busy dude. All right. So let's let's pray for him and let's pray for our hearts. You know, it's it's good to to pray for the man that's going to sow the seed, but it, we better pray that our hearts will be good soil. All right. So while we're while we're praying. Uh, just ask the Lord to really open your heart to receive from the Word of God, all right? Father, we love you. We do thank you for this day, and we thank you for every blessing, God. We thank you that we believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We believe 
in the Word of God. We believe in the truth. We believe in heaven. We believe in hell. We believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We believe that Jesus came and was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died an atoning death, was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven. He's preparing heaven now for us, and he's coming back again, and he will save anybody in this room. We believe, Lord God, if they will repent of their sin and turn to you and by faith receive Jesus, we believe. We believe. Bless this offering, and God, uh, have your hand upon this song. And continue to bless this service, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, Lindsay, come back here just a second. Come, 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 come. This is Lindsay Alexander. I got to say that correctly. And she is uh, married to Ian. And this is baby Alexander right there. October, right? October. All right. So you're going to take the kid to the same Christmas tree this year? Okay. All right. Good deal. All right, we'll give you free tickets. All right. Here. Let's thank the Lord for her. What a great song. Amen. Amen. Well, how many of you have ever watched the Dallas Cowboys play football? Anybody out there? Okay. All right. And uh, Donna and I moved to Texas 38 years ago this month. And uh, the second year we were there, I started working at a church. And one of our main deacons, who has visited Bellevue several times, by the way, Don Cadenhead, who helped build some of the stadiums there in Dallas, uh, and he was a great guy. And uh, he had season tickets to the Cowboys from back when they played at the Cotton Bowl, all right? And so he, he just saw them all, and so he gave us his Monday night tickets. So we're 23 years old, and I go out there, and I just go up through the little walkway and come up and look down on that field, and I'm looking at Tony Dorsett and Too Tall Jones. Can I make a statement? This boy from Dyersburg was really wiped out, all right? I'm just like... I can't believe I'm here. Somebody said, were the cheerleaders there? I said, I don't know. I don't care. I just wanted to see the boys play ball. And they, they won that night. It was great. Well, Jonathan is their chaplain. He is also the chaplain of the Dallas Mavericks. I've seen them play basketball. And uh, he is a great preacher. He preached for us at our men's conference this last year, knocked the ball out of the park, preached for us at the Southern Baptist Convention, knocked the ball out of the park. And uh, you're two for two, man. Don't mess up tonight, all right? So... So he, he, he is a great guy. His, I want to tell you his family. I just mentioned them a while ago. His wife is Kanika, and they have Kelsey, Jonathan II, Camden, and Kyler. Great guy. Came all the way from Texas to visit us. Would you welcome to the Bellevue Pulpit our brother, our, our dear brother, Jonathan Evans. Come on up. How's everybody doing? Everybody all right? Good. It's good to be here. I, uh, when he talked about the Cowboys, I heard that there were a few saved folk in the audience. Uh, uh, some Cowboy fans here and there. Uh, so we're, I'm glad to be here, though, and glad to have the opportunity to share. Uh, he mentioned my family. Uh, I always have to give my wife all the props because if I'm here, that means she's there with all four of those kids. Um, and she's about five months, so she's carrying around extra weight while being supportive and allowing me to do what God has called me to be uh, to do and come here and uh, talk to you guys. We have Kelsey, who is my nine-year-old. Kelsey is my, uh, my artist. She's the one that doesn't want to be held in a box. She's the one who likes to dance, sing, color, paint, um, just do all types of crazy experiments, um, and that's okay. I think that that's great unless she's doing an experiment in my house without my knowledge. <laughs> she will take water, and, and I may have told this to the men, we do our men's ministry uh, in February, but she'll take water, pour it in the lotion bottle, spray it on the mirror, draw pictures, and then invite me in to take a look, like she's not going to get in trouble. <laughs> um, but that's Kelsey. She stretches me, um, and me and my wife, and we have fun with her. And then we have J Jonathan II. We call him J2, just to throw a little swag on it. Um, so my boy, J2, he is my intellectual. He is the thinker. He is the one that asked the famous question, why, which prompts the famous parental response, because I said so, boy. I ain't got time to be explaining everything to you. Uh, he always asking questions. I remember uh, taking him and his older sister, younger brother, to McDonald's because I needed the playground to watch my kids for a little while. And... Uh, I took him in, I fed him, I said, okay, go play. And, 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 and Kelsey and Camden, shoo, they ran on there because, you know, like I thought, kids and playgrounds ought to be compatible. J2 walks up to the playground and goes, <laughs> he's four at the time, um, Dad, I've never been to this playground before, so I'm quite afraid that I might get lost. 
First of all, you're four. Who talks like that? Uh, second of all, it's a playground. You're a little kid. Go play. And then he hit me with a zinger. But, Dad, you don't understand. This is not Chick fil A. <laughs> So that's, that's, my, that's my boy, J2. And then I have Camden. Camden, we call him Spider Cam, appropriately named, uh, because he's that boy's boy. He's swinging from chandeliers. He's not happy unless he's beating up his older brother, tackling his dad, running his head against a wall. That's Camden, in a nutshell. So you know what that is. And then we have Kyler, and Kyler has Daddy wrapped. She's the one who comes to Daddy and says, pick me up. And I said, OK. And I pick her up, and she puts her head right there in the crevice, and you know you lock down once they put their head right there. She puts her hands in her mouth, and she just, mm, and then I go, mm, you know. <laughs> we do it together, and then my wife goes, ugh, you know, and walks off. Um, and then number five is on the way, and we never find out what we're having until the baby comes out. That's when we find out. And so... Uh, we'll let the surprise come uh, when it comes. And so if y'all would continue to pray for our family and pray for a healthy pregnancy, we have gone through four miscarriages. And so that's a part of our story, a part of our testimony, but God has still been faithful. And so I'm excited about that. Let's give uh, Pastor and his wife a hand for leading this church. Um, I know what it is to be a pastor's son. I don't know if anybody in here has heard of Tony Evans. Um, he'll be here, I think, next year. And I know what it is to watch him study and watch him labor over the Word week after week after week and watch him counsel and watch him cast vision and watch him, you know. And so for me to be here and have an opportunity to let him sit down and rest and be poured into is a great opportunity. So I want to thank you, thank your wife, and thank the entire church just for welcoming me in. All right, y'all ready to jump into God's Word for a little bit? All right, let's do it. Let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. If you don't do anything else, Lord, I love to say it, you've already done enough when you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Help us to not walk around like entitled children, like we deserve something. We are unworthy, and you saw us as worthy, and we just give you the praise and glory. Help us to honor you with our life, not just with our talk, but with our walk, not just with our articulations, but with our actions. And help our testimony breathe into the life of others so that they can come to you. We love you and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Today I want to talk to you real quick just about one verse. One verse found in Genesis chapter 50, 20. It's a verse that you know a verse that you've heard before, it is a great verse. Genesis chapter 50, 20. It comes towards the end of Joseph's life, and he makes a monster statement. This one verse kind of encompasses all of our testimonies together, but this is a verse of a, of a testimony. And this testimony is massive, said in one verse. And it simply says this, Joseph looks at his brothers and he says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In order to bring about this present result, which is to preserve many people alive. This is what I call a testimony for the ages. Because in this one sentence is your testimony, it's my testimony, it's pastor's testimony, it's my dad's testimony, it will be your children's testimony, it's your grandparents' testimony. Because right here, he's letting you know how life works itself out. He's letting you know and trying to give you hindsight 2020 vision. So if right now you're in the evil part of your testimony or things aren't working out well, or you're finding yourself in a pit like we'll talk about in just a second, he's giving you hindsight to let you know beforehand how this thing is going to wind up. A lot of times these things start bad. But then when God shows up, good shows up. And he's able to turn that thing around and make that bad thing suddenly a good thing. 
then he's doing it because he has a purpose and destiny for your life that he's calling you to. There's a reason why the great manufacturer created you and designed you specific for a call that he has for you. That's called the present result or where he's taking you. And it's always for the kingdom of God to preserve somebody else's life. If we end up thinking, like I said in February, that it's about uh, uh, the human trinity and not the spiritual trinity, me, myself, and I, we'll never get to our Genesis 50 testimony. Because God is always thinking about the advancement of his kingdom, even while he allows you to go through some hard times. Joseph is just simply giving you hindsight vision to let you see this a little bit more clearly, no matter what stage of the testimony that you're currently in. He's letting you know that this thing, when God makes an investment, a lot of times it's going to start in the red. But the purpose of the investment is to slowly make its way to the black so that we can get you to a present result that I'm calling you to, and it will always be for the benefit of somebody else. Is there anybody in the room that wants to be blessed? If you don't raise your hand, you're not telling the truth and you're in church. Most people will say, I want to be blessed, and they'll say that a blessing is the favor of God to me. That is a half definition of a blessing. A blessing is the favor of God to me so that it might flow through me. God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. God is not interested in a cul-de-sac Christian. He's looking for conduits. And he'll allow you to go through what you're going through, and he'll give you, allow you to go through some detours to your destiny in order that you will be better positioned to advance his kingdom and be the conduit through which power can flow to the next person and the next person and the next person. Joseph is just letting you know, giving you a little hindsight, 2020 vision on where you're standing right now. It's going to be some times that are hard. My dad always said it best. He said, Jonathan, you're either in a storm on your way to a storm or you just got out of one. That's just the way that it works. Storms and trials and tribulations and pits are like that mail you get in your mailbox that says occupant. Translation, we don't care who lives here. (laughs) By the mere fact that you're here, that'll be a part of your testimony. Have you ever told your testimony before? Your testimony will sound a little bit like this. You know, I went through this in my marriage. I went through this in my college years. I I went through some hard financial times, my career struggles. There is all of these different things, wayward children. I can't tell you enough about how hard it was when I went through A, B, C, or D. But God turned around and made it good. Let me tell you what God did. And now I'm able to do what I'm currently doing at a whole nother level. And that's why I'm able to talk to you to try to preserve your life. Joseph is just letting you know. He's given you a testimony for the ages. Over 4,000 years ago, he's making this statement, just letting you know and giving you some encouragement tonight on how this thing is going to work itself out. He let his brothers know, you meant this for evil. What was he talking about? You know the story. He was talking about Genesis 37, verse 23 and 24 where he told his brothers his dream. He was the favored one of the father, and the father gave him this multicolored tunic that he put on him, this royal-ish robe that Joseph was wearing around, and his brothers didn't like it that much because no one gave them the memo that favor wasn't fair. But then he went on and told him them his dream that one day they were going to bow down to him. One day he was going to be in charge. He was going to be the head honcho. He told them the dream that, that God had put on his heart. And once they heard what was in him, they devoted themselves to strip him. In verse 23 of 24, it says, his brothers stripped him of his tunic that his father gave him. They threw him into a pit. And then it says, now the pit was empty and waterless. So when he's telling his testimony in Genesis chapter 50, he's letting you know about the struggle in Genesis chapter 37. He's letting you know that there were the people who were closest to him that were the people that wanted to see his demise and his failure. You know things are bad when the people in your own family are under the sphere of your influence who are supposed to be pushing you forward are the ones trying to hold you back from what God is calling you. 
You know things aren't going well where home is the place where you don't feel at home. You know things are moving backwards when the people you think you can tell your dreams to would be more happy to see your dreams not come true. And that's happened to many people in this room where you don't get the support where you feel like the most support should come from. That's where Joseph was. He was looking at his brothers and he said, you meant this thing for evil. What they wanted to do is strip him of the external evidence that was given to him of the father's favor of his life. But it was because they couldn't strip him of his dream. His dream was on the inside. They can't do anything about what has been put in him. So because they can't do anything about what was sowed in him, they wanted to strip him of anything that was external evidence of it. Let me tell you what the enemy does so that you understand how this works. The enemy will strip you of all of the external evidences of the Father's favor. But the reason why he's doing it is because he wants you to feel like you no longer have the Father's favor. If he can get you to think, well, maybe it's not what I thought. If he can get you to say, well, maybe God is who, not who I thought he was. If he can start getting you to doubt internally based on what he does externally, then he has done his job because he does not want you to get to that Genesis 50 testimony. He does not want you to get to the place where you're in your purpose, serving the kingdom of God and preserving lives that you've been called to preserve. So he'll steal things from you externally, but it's always to try to get an internal result. If you look at the book of Job, that's the way it worked out, where he was taking things from Job, his, his family, he was taking his home, he put boils on his skin. He was doing all of these things on the outside, but the point of the book of Job is so that he would deny God on the inside. If you look at Adam and Eve, he showed them the fruit and all of these external things that they were not supposed to eat of, but if he could just get them to do something on the outside, it'll produce sin on the inside and mess up the whole world. He did it. He tried it with Jesus. If you just, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. I'll, I'll give you all of these different things. If you just turn this rock into bread, all of these different things he tried to present to Jesus Christ. But then he told him under one condition, I need you to bow down and worship me. The enemy doesn't want anyone in this room to get to their Genesis 50 testimony to be able to talk about the goodness of God in their life, to be able to preserve somebody else's life. So what does he do? He wants to strip you on the outside so that you can be stripped of your calling on the inside. And then you wind up in a pit. You wind up depressed. You wind up feeling like God has nothing for me. I'm just meandering. He's not answering my prayers. You start talking down about God because of the external things that you're losing in your life and the financial crisis that you're going through in your life and the fact that people are being taken away that you love in your life and the things that have been stripped from your life. And then we start having a spiritual decay on the inside in this pit that's simply empty and waterless. And Satan is saying that is the goal, to make you think that if you lose the external evidence of the Father's favor, that you've actually lost the Father's favor. One of the sad realities today is that people connect their stuff to whether the God loves them or not. People connect what they have with whether God is with them or not. But trust me, after Joseph was stripped, he was in jail and God was with him. Potiphar's wife lied against him, but God was still with him. God will allow you to be stripped because when you're stripped of those things, that's when you're really equipped of who he is. Here, what the enemy is doing, in this case, is Joseph's brothers, is they're simply saying, I know what's in you, but because I can't get to that, I'll strip you of anything that represents it. And that's what the enemy is doing with many of our lives in the room if the truth be told, with many of the decaying situations that we have, whether it's our marriage that he's trying to strip apart, whether it's our children that he's trying to strip away, 
whether it's our career, whether it's our finances, all he's trying to do is to get this internal result that drops you into a pit so you cannot move forward to your palace because he does not want anyone in this room to be able to look up one day and say, yeah, that was bad. But when God came through, he made that thing good. You see where I'm standing now? All of that happened to bring me to where I am right now. And now that I'm here, I learned that if God is for you, who in the world can be against you? And I get a chance to preserve somebody's life. He's saying, you meant this thing for evil, but God meant it for good in order to bring me to where I am, to preserve somebody's life, to advance the kingdom of God, that this is what this is all about. Let me explain something to you, especially for those of you who are really going through something right now, which I know is true in this house tonight. I would like to say that if the brothers didn't know what was in Joseph, they would have no reason to strip Joseph. Okay, stay with me here. If they didn't know what was in him, they would have no reason to strip him. What was in him was the reason why they stripped him. That means that the stripping of him was evidence that God was taking him somewhere. That when you're going through something and you feel like the enemy is stripping things away and God is allowing, that, allowing it, that should be evidence to you that God is trying to take you somewhere because if it wasn't in you, then he wouldn't waste his time to strip you. That's why you can't quit when you find yourself in the pit. That's why you can't give up. The pit is evidence that the enemy is trying to stop you from something great that God has called you to. If it wasn't for what was in you, he'd leave you alone. The reason why you're going through what you're going through is because he knows the greatness that's been planted in you. He knows the greatness that's been planted in that wayward child. He knows the greatness that's been planted in that marriage. If it ever comes together, or the force that it could be. He knows the greatness that's been planted in your situation and circumstances. And he wants to create drama so that you can never say what Joseph said. So that you can never look back down the sands of life and see any footprints at all. So that you could feel like you've been left behind, so that you can feel like God does not care, so that your testimony will not be about God's goodness, so that other lives cannot be preserved. But just keep in mind that if right now you're on a detour, it may be frustrating, but it still means you're going somewhere. Don't let him trick you into thinking that you're not going somewhere. Now, many people will ask me, get it all the time, especially with the Cowboys, if God is so good, then why do I experiment so much, experience so much bad? Logical question. If God is good, you know, in the church, for God is good all the time and all the time, Oh, yeah, really? For some of us in here, we're saying, yeah, but you can't tell me that right now. If the truth be told. I know we're sitting in church, and it's kind of churchy and all that kind of stuff. There's some people going through some stuff right now in this room. They smile in your face, but they cry as soon as you leave. And they're pondering the goodness of God. But if God is good, then why do I experiment so mu experience so much bad? I'd like to suggest that it's the bad that illuminates how good God is. That if everything was good all the time, then you wouldn't even know where the good was coming from. Matter of fact, by the time you got to your testimony, if everything was all good, God would probably not be included in it because you wouldn't even know that was him that was bringing it.
When's the last time you went to a superhero movie and there was no villain and no problem? <laughs> that would be the dumbest movie you've ever seen in your life. Here Superman is flying around, showing off his power, and after a while, people will be like, oh yeah, well, well, he, can, he can fly, he can do a few things we can't do. Okay, who cares? Because I see his power, but he's not yet my hero. When there's a problem in Metropolis, and they see Superman, it changes the way they praise. When there's a problem in Metrop Metropolis and they see Superman, it changes the way they, they say, it's a bird, no. It's a plane, no, it's Superman. it's Superman. Why? Because now they know his power will make itself resident in my circumstances. God will allow you to go through some things so that you can illuminate how good he is in your life. Not so that you can just talk about his power, but you can talk about his power in correlation with your circumstances. That's how you get a testimony. That's how this thing comes to light. So God will allow those bad things to take place because that's how you give him the greater glory. And I always say it, that the size of your praise will be equal to the size of the hell that God has brought you out of. If your praise ain't big, just wait. You just ain't experienced that big problem yet. That he came to be a superhero in your life to solve. It says you meant this thing for evil. But God was able to swoop in and turn around and, and make this thing good. You meant it for evil. Watch this. God meant it for good. He's talking about the same exact thing. How did the evil suddenly become good in the same exact location? How was God able to take that circumstance and situation and flip it and turn it around? God is a meaning changer of your circumstances. Because if it's not good yet, God's not done yet. Romans 8, 28 lets us know that all things work out for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes, that those that he foreknew, he already predestined to be conformed into the image of his son so that he may be the firstborn of many brethren. And those that he uh, uh, predestined, he also called. And those that he called, he justified. And those that he justified, he glorified. So what then can you say? If God has got you, then who can be against you? That's just something that we have to remember from time to time. That God's got this. He's not shocked. You're shocked. He's not shocked. But he will use those things and turn it around to good. Since he's talking about the same circumstance, I just want to go back to that circumstance and point out a few little details that you need to know about why God allowed it to happen for Joseph and how he used it and flipped it. He was stripped of his tunic. The tunic was the authority of the father. The tunic meant dominion. The, the, the tunic meant uh, uh, favor. The tunic meant all of those things that were stripped from him. But in Genesis 41, verse 42, you see that he's second in command in Pharaoh's house. What does Pharaoh give him? A royal robe. Pharaoh gives him a signet ring. Pharaoh gives him a necklace. In other words, he got the years back trifecta on what the locusts have taken away. Because when you're ready, God will set you up. He will allow you to be stripped so that you're perfectly positioned to be equipped. When you are down to nothing, trust me, it's only because God is up to something. God will allow you to be stripped of what you have. In other words, he'll let you go all the way down to nakedness. He'll allow you to be stripped of what you have. Why? Because he wants to have you before he gives you what he has. See, Joseph was parading around in this robe and talking noise about his dreams. 
He allowed that to happen to humble Joseph so that he can give him more than he had in his hands than Joseph ever experienced from his father Jacob. You're losing it, but I've got more in my hands than what you're losing. So I'll let you lose what you have because my concern is that I have you before I give you what I have. Uh, There's some some people in here who are in the, the rough patch of their testimony. Or you know someone right now in your sphere of influence, in your family, who does not understand why they are going through what they're going through. And I want you to be able to go back tonight and tell them and tell yourself that sometimes God will strip you, but it's only because he's preparing to equip you. That's why you cannot give up. At our church, we just had one of our financial advisors at our church shot himself in the head. Been at our church for a long time. As he got into a situation with finances and all of those different things, and he thought that the pit was too deep for God to climb him out of there. Sometimes God will let you hit rock bottom, but it's only because he's trying to let you know that he is the rock at the bottom. Unbeknownst to us, we would have never thought that. He came to church on awesome Wednesday nights. We would have never looked at Dexter Thomas and thought that he was in so much pain. We would have never known. He's in church. Trust me when I tell you. There are some people in this room that God had called to be in this room tonight that are on the brink of giving up. If it's not good yet, Hang in there. God's not done yet. Don't stop. Because the enemy is only stripping you and throwing you into that pit that's empty and waterless, which means you have very few provisions in there. So that you'll say, you win. I'll never see my Genesis 50 testimony. You win. If I don't say anything else tonight, Do not give up. He was equipped. He was second in command. He got to see what God was taking him through even after he was stripped. My dad, um, you know, we got the church and he's always been called to have his church and all of those different things. And um, we got to get into a school back in the 80s. The church started in 76. Uh, I wasn't alive then, but a lot of things were going on then. And we had a school that we were in. And so he felt the father's favor because the way the school came about was just really cool that they would get that auditorium space and be able to worship in that school and have a space for them to assemble as saints. And so him and my mom were really excited about that space. But after one year, the district reconvened and decided they weren't going to allow the church to stay. And so it seemed like he didn't understand why God would allow him to have it, then suddenly it would be stripped away. And so there was some contention there with my dad as he reminds me of what he went through of trying to figure out why God would give it, then allow it to be taken, and trying to figure out why God would work and operate the way that he's working and operating. And so he's sitting down having a meeting with one of his buddies, Bob Brunick, which is one of the old linebackers for the Dallas Cowboys. And he's talking to Bob Brunick and he's telling him the story about how this was stripped away from him and it was given to him and he's kind of confused. We don't have a place to meet. I thought I had the Father's favor in my life. We don't have a place to go um, and, and Sunday's coming around. We don't know what we're going to do. As he's talking to Bob Brunick, another gentleman walks by. He walks by the room and then he steps back to stay and listen to the conversation. Now, my dad notices as he's talking to Bob Brunick about other potential places that there is a nosy man standing back there listening to his conversation that he's trying to have private with Bob Brunick. I mean, just nosy. And so he stands there, and then he lets my dad know he's not going anywhere because he leans against the door and crosses his legs. (laughs) 
So at this point, my dad is now evangelically ticked off, as he likes to say, <laughs> because he doesn't understand why this man is standing at the door listening to his conversation. And then the man comes and sits down and crosses his legs. So at this point, he's got smoke coming out of his ears and fire coming out of his nose because he doesn't know how this man, who he's never met, never seen, can be this nosy. And to top it all off, then he starts asking questions. He starts asking questions about the church and how long have you been to church and when did God call you and all of these different things. Well, did you graduate from seminary and all of the, you know, all of these different things. And my dad is thinking, Bozo, who are you? Why are you here? And then he started asking questions about potential new spaces and, and what were you thinking about and how are you going to get the money and, and all of those things. And my dad is saying, I don't know, Bob, who is this guy? And then he says, God has been touching my heart recently in my prayer time about coming along someone to help them. So when I pass by your door, I heard God talking to me. Now, when he said that, my, all, listen, my dad's countenance on his face just changed. <laughs> all of a sudden, he sat up and he perked up and, he, and he, 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 he hit his suit like this and he started dusting his shoulder off and, you know, he started wiggling his legs. You know, everything started going in him because now he sees this is a little bit different. And he says, what about this chapel that I heard you talking about? And the man said, and my dad said, well, yeah, that chapel, but it's, it's too expensive. It's $200,000. You know, it'll be great for our congregation. It's got a lot of land next to it, but, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to do anything with that. The guy looked at my dad and said, well, you're an answer to prayer for me. He pulled out his checkbook. He wrote a check for $200,000, and he handed it to my father. If he wouldn't have been stripped of that school, he would have never been sitting in that seat. That man would have never walked past that door, and that check would have never hit his hands. God knows what he's doing. But it's those who wait on the Lord. They're the ones whose strength is renewed. You got to wait. That's the hard part. How long do I have to wait? I don't know. <laughs> but you certainly can't throw in the towel when you serve a God just that big. He's able to equip you with a whole lot more than the enemy stripped you from. But watch this. This is something I want, want to make sure you get on this Wednesday night. It says that the pit was empty and waterless. Now, I have no idea at the time that I first read this text, why in the world would the author add that little clause? It's enough to know that he got stripped. It's enough to know that he was thrown in a pit. And then it says, now the pit was empty and waterless. The author wants you to know the nature of the pit that Joseph was thrown in. So I thought about that for a second. What does that have to do with anything? Why would he express that? If God makes it for good, it correlates somewhere. So I'm, try, I'm praying about this and trying to figure out why I need to know the nature of this pit. Shh. Come on, Holy Spirit. It just dawned on me. That when Joseph was second in command in, it, in, in Egypt... The, re the way he got there was by letting Pharaoh know his dream. Are you still with me? Are you tracking with me? There was going to be seven years of plenty, and there was going to be seven years of famine. Joseph was over making sure they had enough put away so that the people could get through the famine. So Joseph got there, his testimony, to preserve life. How was he preserving life? through a famine. A famine means that Egypt is empty and waterless. So what God allowed Joseph to do in his pit was experience evidence of his promise. 
He's letting him see that where he is is how he's going to use him where he will be. He's letting him get the experience so that he doesn't just have head knowledge of a famine, but he has experiential knowledge of a famine. Now he's better positioned to do ministry because he's not just talking you through a famine, he's sympathizing with your weaknesses as you go through a famine. Jesus is the same way. Hebrews 4 chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, 15 says, we serve a great high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. When you go to preserve life, understand that God is going to use what you've gone through to do ministry to advance his kingdom in the next person. People who have gone through sexual abuse don't want to just know that you have head knowledge or read a book about it. They want to know that you have some experience of it and you can sympathize with them. You can do ministry on a whole nother level, but you got to go through something first. He let Joseph, if you pay attention to what you're going through, in your pit is evidence of your promise. If you look closely at the things that you're experiencing and you wait on God and he renews your strength, I guarantee you that what will excite you about helping somebody else will be directly correlated to what you already went through yourself. People have experienced that time and time again. And that's why I love Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something that God the Father does not know. Uh-oh. Sounds heretical, doesn't it? God the Father knows everything actual. He knows everything potential. But he does not know everything experiential. If you ask God the Father, what does it feel like to sin? He couldn't tell you. Now, he knows everything about sin, but he's never done it. So he doesn't have the experience of everything that he knows, which is why I'm excited about Jesus Christ. Because when I pray and I say, in Jesus' name, amen, that's not just a religious tagline for your prayers. You're trying to get the one who has the experiential knowledge to sign off and tell God the Father exactly what that feels like. But you got to feel it in order to be able to minister appropriately. He's not saying this to us because he hasn't done it himself. Jesus has felt it. He knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what it is to be betrayed by the people that he came to save. He knows what it is to be rejected. He knows what it is to be slaughtered. He can sympathize. And if you're going to advance his kingdom, if he's preparing you for the palace of purpose, the best way to be able to minister is to be able to sympathize, which means there is purpose in your pain. That's why you can't quit. That's why you can't get, do you know how many people are dependent upon your testimony? We are delivered by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That if you quit before you can tell your testimony, then you just prevented a lot of lives from being preserved by hearing how, what God has done for you in your life. There's evidence in the pit. Um, my dad often says that my mom is the leftover queen. When I was growing up, she used to cook these big old dinners uh, on Sunday. So we look forward to Sunday because Sunday was the bomb, okay? She used to cook these big old dinners, you know, fried chicken. We had ham. We had macaroni and cheese. We had greens. We, we was all just sitting in there like this after dinner. <laughs> but on Monday, she wasn't about to cook again. <laughs> she was the Tupperware queen. She put everything in Tupperware and she'd pull it out. And she would make something random. Like she would just put noodles in a pot, throw the chicken in there, throw the macaroni and cheese, put this over there and that over there. She'd sprinkle some cheese and some cream of mushroom or something. That's the best stuff I tasted in my life. <laughs> because my dad would look at us and say, it's leftovers. And then he'd look at my mom and say, but it's leftovers in the hands of a master. <laughs> you may feel like you ain't got nothing left, that it's just leftovers. 
that you've been put away, that you've been uh, in the dump. But it's leftovers in the hands of a master. God will take you out. He'll chop it up. He'll dice it up. He'll put some, some cheese on it. He'll put some cream of Holy Ghost on it. <laughs> and serve you up a life better than what you already thought you had. But you got to wait. Hang in there. Don't give up. Because Joseph said in Genesis 41, 51, he said he had a son named Manasseh. You know why he named him Manasseh? Manasseh means I forgot about all my trouble. You mean to tell me, Joseph, that God was so good to you that you forgot? Now, how did you forget? He wasn't saying that he forgot cognitively because when he gives his testimony, he's referring to the pain. But he's saying that God has turned this thing around so good that even though I remember, it doesn't have control over me where I currently am. Um, this is not going to be your testimony, but m me and my wife, when we had our first child, it was a beast. 16 hours of labor. She had contractions that went up, up, no breaks for about 30 minutes. They had to give her a shot to slow him down. It was, I didn't know what was going on. It was baby number one. I was like, we ain't never doing this again. <laughs> you know, I was saying sweet stuff like, oh, I, ow, I really wish I could take your place in my mind. No, I don't. I'm, dead. <laughs> mm -mm. I'm not built for that. We don't. This was, ugh, I said, uh, so I prepared, baby came out great, but I prepared, you know, Pastor Gaines, I said, yeah, I need to be okay with the fact that we're probably going to only have one child. I can't imagine that my wife is going to say, let's do it again. But I can't imagine that. So I set myself up and was prepared that this was going to be it. Ten months later, My wife came up to me, and she said, I think I'm ready to have another baby. I said, what? <laughs> Are you serious right now? She said, yeah, I think I'm ready to have another baby. I said, but do you remember <laughs> that scenario? She said, yeah. She said, yeah, I remember. And then she held Kelsey up and said, but look at this baby. Because what God birthed through her was greater than the pain of what she went through. And so now we have five. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of all fun for me. I don't, so she wants to do it. I mean. It's like, are you sure? Yes. Great. God wants to deliver something in you, but the mere fact that he wants to deliver something in you means that the expectation should be that there's going to be a little pain on the way. This is not just something that I like to talk about as I encourage you tonight to stick with him. This is part of my story. You heard him say, you're the chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, that's the present result. That's why you can never look at somebody and think that you just know their story about what you see. My dream was just to run out the tunnel in the NFL. I was like, God, I'm Batman. I need you to be Robin and answer my prayers. I want to run out this tunnel. That's all I want to do. I mean, I played hard. I tried hard for it. I ended up getting hurt. I went to NFL Europe, which was a disaster. No English-speaking channels, white walls, white sheets. Three months. I, it was just, I tried to quit football. I called my dad and I said, Dad, this is not for me. I'm crying. 
things are bad. And I had the real cry. You know when you're crying for real, your, your neck keeps cocking back and you can't stop it? <laughs> you know. I had the real cry. I was hurting. Couldn't believe that I was about to quit football. It was the game that I loved, but I had been just dragged through the mud, and I got cut from the Cowboys, got sent to NFL Europe, and I went and told my coach, I said, I'm quitting from football today in 2006. And he said, you sure you want to do that? You can play, man. You can play. We can use you. I said, yeah, I'm done. I already booked my flight today. That's what I told the coach. Looked him right in the eyes. He said, well, you can't leave today because you have to do exit physicals before you leave so that we can say that you weren't hurt. So I called my dad and I said, Dad, I'm coming home, but we have to rebook my flight for the next day. My dad said, don't you think that's interesting that you didn't get to leave when you wanted to leave? I said, oh, here goes this great philosopher. <laughs> he said, I want you to do something for me. I want you to go back out to practice tomorrow since you got to be here anyway. And I want you to ask if God wants you here to give you a peace that surpasses understanding and see what he does. Why don't you include him this time? I went out there and I said, said the prayer. Initially, nothing happened. I was about to throw my helmet. I was crying while doing the drills. Then we went to inside drill, nine on seven, which means all runs, no passes, and I'm a fullback for all of you football people. That means we're hitting. I kid you not, I put my hand in the dirt, and as soon as my hand hit the dirt, shh, hmm. they said, Hut, I must have went through there and split the wig of that middle linebacker. I can still feel it now, Pastor Gaines. It just feels good. I know it's a little violent. It's just a game. I turned back to the coach and I said, I'm, set. I'm staying immediately. He said, well, great. I'm glad you decided to stay. By the time the season was over, seven players accepted Christ. I got a new nickname. All of my teammates call me Rev in the locker room. What's up, Rev? I started counseling guys in their marriage and their, all, these, all these different things. And so I figured it out. When I went back to the Tennessee Titans, I said, I got it. Do the God thing and he'll let you run out of the tunnel. <laughs> I was still trying to run out of the tunnel. And I said, I'm leading prayers. I'm like, do you know Jesus? Well, you need to know him right now. <laughs> no got hurt in Tennessee, go to Buffalo. They decide not to have any fullbacks on their team, got cut there. Go to Washington, got cut again. Come on, Jesus. Why are you letting me go through the gauntlet like this? Why are you not, I'm good. Why are you not allowing me to play? 2011, I found out. I'm finally standing in the tunnel. Can't tell you how good it feels. Called my dad. I said, Dad, we did it. We are in the tunnel. He said, Amen, son. Amen. That a way to wait. That a way to wait. You feel renewed? Man, like never before. Let's go. Now, what you should be asking yourself is why in the world do you have your cell phone in the tunnel? Because the first time I ran out on the field for an NFL game, I wasn't a player. I was the chaplain. God let me go through everything they go through. And it was hard. But when God showed up, good showed up. Oh, he equipped me. I've been the chaplain for seven years. I probably would have never even played that long. He gave me more than what I lost. It was to bring about this present result. And just last week, another three players got saved because he called me to preserve many lives. (laughs) 
There are people in this room right now that you're thinking about giving up the towel. You don't know if you can stick it out anymore. But if you don't even learn from my testimony, learn from Jesus' testimony. Jesus came into a stadium that he was rejected to play in. He came up to the plate and he put up his bat. The enemy threw him a curveball, but with his perfect righteousness, crack, he hit a home run. He ran around first base of rejection. He ran around second base of betrayal and death. He ran around third base of resurrection, and then he went home to be seated at the right hand of the Father. Everybody in the stadium may not have liked it, but those who have his uniform that are in they, that dugout, they love it. Why? Because his home run, his testimony, is a credit to your victory. Without his testimony, you have no testimony. It's all about Jesus Christ. I want to pray for those right now, and I want to invite you right now. If you're going through something hard right now, and it's just tough. I want you to come right up here with me so we can pray about it. If you're going through something right now and it's just eating you up, you come right up here so we can pray about it. We'll take however much, much time we need. There are some people in here who are going through some things. But I want to let you know that you have a testimony. You come right up here. I'll wait. They may not say it to your face, but we're living life. You have a testimony. For all of you who are still seated, who you may have made it to the, the good part. You may have made it to the result part. You may have made it to the pres preservation part. But you remember what it was like to be at this part. I want you to pray for these people who come. Take whatever posture you want to take. Because today, we say we will not give up. Take your time. We have time for the Lord. We want to be renewed. Pastor Gaines, I'm going to ask if you will come up and pray over your people, over the flock that God has given you. Because we have some people that just before they walked in the door were ready to throw in the towel. But if it's not good yet, God's not done yet. our heads bowed and our hearts toward the Lord all these people just if you're kneeling just stay in that position but I want you congregation just the people out there would you stand up right now just the people out there people here at the altar you stay right where you are would you just reach out your hand toward these people and pray for them pray out loud just pray for them right now let's all pray pray out loud Pray for them like you would want somebody to pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that when we come to this place, we don't have to have it all together because you do have it all together. And Lord, we are incomplete, but you are complete. We are insecure, but you are secure. We are messed up, but you are high and lifted up. 
And Lord God, we pray, we, we cast our cares before you right now because you care for us. And Lord God, uh, there is every kind of need that is represented at this altar. And Lord, uh, no way that I could know it all. But you know every heart. You know every person. You know everything they are going through. Financial problems, family problems, health problems, emotional problems, discouragement, fear, rejection, confusion. Lord, struggling even with disbelief, unbelief. Oh, Father, how I pray in the name of Jesus that you will meet these precious people at the point of their need and that you would pull them out of the miry clay and set their feet on a rock, put a new song in their heart, a song of praise to their God. Lord, I think about Joseph being in that situation for 13 years. Lord, he spent from 17 to the age of 30 in prison and it looked like his life was gone but when you moved Lord it, it looked like it took you a long time but when you moved you moved quickly and pulled him out and you raised him up and he had gone through that school dear God that only you can teach us in and you raised him up to save a nation and not just to save a nation but to save a people known by you. Lord, I just, I just pray, God, that you would let these people see that there is a purpose in all of their pain. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, let them just sp spread out on you right now in their hearts, dear God. Give up every, every other thing and just hold on to you. Oh, God, let us pray for these. With our heads bowed, how many of you will say, I will pray, even though I don't know what their needs are, I will pray for the people who have come up here tonight. I will pray for them for the rest of this week. I will pray for them on a regular basis. How many of you people out there would do that? Amen. Amen. God work a work of miraculous power in their lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even in that pit, we are never alone, that you never leave us or forsake us. And you are that rock solid bottom upon which we stand. And when the storms of life beat against us, we will not go down because we are founded upon the rock of Jesus Christ. And we choose to believe the promises of God, which for every believer are yes in Christ Jesus. So I'm asking, Father, that you would grant every person that came forward tonight that the enemy has been lying to, that you would expose those lies for exactly what they are. And God, that they would refuse them and take them captive in the name of Jesus Christ and Lord that you would flood their heart and mind with your truth with the promises that you have given for us to build our lives upon and they will choose to believe you they will choose to believe your word because God that is our job our job is simply to believe and then God you do all the rest of it so I'm asking you to bless every single person that is calling upon the name of Jesus right now that they will choose to believe you that they will believe that they will ask you to speak to them through your word and that they will then proclaim that promise and pray it back to you and wait on you until you bring it to fulfillment. I thank you that you are faithful, God. I thank you that you are good and you only do good. And God, that your ultimate good is not just for us, but it is for us, but it is also for the preserving of life and for bringing glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ. So I bless every single one of these people with the testimony that you are already given them, the testimony that you are working out in their life right now of your faithfulness, your provision, and your power on their behalf. Do it, Father, for your name's sake, in Jesus' name.
all of you that are kneeling, would you just stand up for me just for a moment? I don't want any of you to sing. Any of you out there, I don't want you to sing. Not yet. But I want all of you at this altar. If you don't know this song, we'll sing it twice. And it's just a simple song. Somebody's praying. I can feel it. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me. Let's just sing it right now. Somebody's pray. You folks right here. I can feel it. It's on the screen. Somebody's pray for me. Mighty hands are guiding me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Somebody's praying for me. Now, let's, would you mind? Can we sing with you? Would that be okay? Let's all sing. Somebody's praying. I can feel. How many of you feel that tonight? Amen. Somebody's praying for me. Mighty hands are guiding me to protect me from what I can't see. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. As some Somebody's praying for me. Amen. Hey, you preached tonight, man. Amen. Amen. You brought it. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Woo! Man, you've been lifting weights, brother. All right. We've got some great books. Uh, Y'all just stay with us. We're almost through. Uh, He is an author. Jonathan is. And uh, so is his dad. They've got some great books. Uh, One that they wrote together is a spiritual workout for uh, athletes get in the game. Tony Evans and Jonathan Evans. Uh, his dad's book, Detours, The Unpredictable Path to Your Destiny. And then a devotional for both men and women. He'll be in our bookstore. Uh, Steve, why don't you take him? Bill, you going to take him? Take him right there, if you, if you will. Take him out there. But why don't we just thank him one more time, Jonathan Evans, for <laughs> preaching for us. Amen. 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 You know, uh, if you want to get one of those books and just meet him, he'll be over there. Every year we do this, we always have a staff meeting and say, well, I don't know, should we do Awesome August this year? Yeah, we should, we should. We've been doing it 13 years, and uh, it seems like it gets better every year. Thomas, come here, brother, come up here. This is our pastor at Frazier, Bellevue, uh, Bellevue Frazier. Let's thank God for Thomas McGee. Amen. Amen. <laughs> this guy, man, I tell you what, he could, he could go bear hunting with a switch, couldn't he? Amen. That's right. He, uh, he is our pastor out there. He's on the city council of Millington, Tennessee. He is an uh, officer with the military. He, he's just a great guy, and we love him. He is our pastor at Bellevue Frazier. And I want you to close us with a word of prayer. I love you, brother. Thank God for you and for what you do. He serves the Lord. You guys went out the other night in Frazier and uh, shared the gospel, didn't you? Yes, sir, we did. We did. Praise God, everybody. Oh, we serve a mighty good God. This mic is hot. I didn't plan to do this. Thank you, Pastor Gaines. And uh, our speaker tonight was wonderful, wasn't he? 
And I feel the spirit of our God moving in this place. What beautiful faces I'm looking in. We are going through a period of time that I've never experienced in my life. And I'm so glad that my Father God placed me amongst this Bible-believing, Jesus-focused church where so many are focused on others and not on themselves. And I'm living the dream. I'm living the dream. God is able to do all those things that we need to have done. Pastor Gaines didn't tell you so. I'm going to tell you. He's going to be with us on Saturday at a block party in Frazier. Amen. Between two and five, we may not have enough balloons for all of you, but as many as you come, we will do the best we can to keep you uh, uh, busy with all the things that we plan. But Pastor Gaines is our featured speaker, and we're looking so forward to having him uh, be with us. And I'm going to do as you've asked me, and we'll, we'll close. Amen. Amen. Pray with me as we prepare to leave this place, but never the conscious awareness of the goodness and the grace of our God. And we call on you tonight, God, to bless these beautiful people as they leave this place. Uh, be with us as we think and meditate on the things that we've heard tonight. Oh, how good it is to hear a word, Lord. Tonight, uh, you spoke to us, and uh, the things that we're going through sometimes seem like they will never end and seem like there's no benefit in them. But we pray that we would find your will for our lives in all of the things that you take us through. And we pray for these that have heard your word tonight. May they be worthy receptacles. May the hearts be fertile ground for that seed that's been planted. And may we share it. May we seek opportunities and take advantage of them where they come that we might be able to save others. This word that we've heard from you in the presence of many witnesses. We share it. We entrust it to faithful men that they may teach others, be able to teach others also. And we pray that you'll be with us now as we leave this place, but never the conscious awareness of your presence, your power, and your provision. And we pray your blessing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen.